When I first started my agency back in 2006, I was given some very wise advice from senior business leaders who had been there and had done it before. I was young, I was 23, I was setting out on my own, and I didn't really know a lot about business and I didn't know a lot about sales. But here's what I was told. Mark, they said, you need to go where the money is. Make sure that you're actually selling to people who can afford your services and are willing to pay for it. And then this led to the next piece of advice, which is <laughs> you have to drive real value. People will only pay for things that they value. And I wish at the time I had given a third piece of advice, but it took me a few years to figure it out. Because yes, you wanna go after people who can afford your services and are willing to pay for it. Yes, people are willing to pay for things that they value. But the third piece of advice that I was missing out on was I didn't know how to explain my value to people. I didn't know how to figure out what they valued most. I didn't know how to present and share a story in a way to tie what I did with the values that they had. And so you can have the greatest products you can have the best service. You can have the best team and the most competitive pricing. You could have the strongest value prop in the world. But if people don't know about your company, if people don't know who you are, if people don't understand your services, and if they don't value what you do, you're not going to sell anything. And so much of this comes down to how you communicate and how you present. And that's exactly what we'll explore with today's guest, Victor Antonio. Victor is a renowned sales expert. He's an author. He's a business consultant with a 20 plus year career as a top sales executive. He's held leadership roles, uh, including president of global sales and marketing for a $420 million company. He was vice president of international sales for a Fortune 500 company. And uh, all along the way, he's been recognized for his excellence in sales management. Now, Victor's also been the host of Spike TV's reality series, Life or Debt. He's the author of 13 books on sales and motivation. He is a speaker. Uh, we are gonna get into so much of this and more on today's episode. But at the end of the day, you're gonna walk away from this episode having a really deep understanding of how to be a better speaker, how to be a better presenter, and ultimately how to sell more. And so I wanna welcome you to the How to Sell More podcast, the podcast for non-salespeople where each week we give a masterclass to help ambitious B2B leaders tackle the biggest challenge every business owner, every sales and marketing team faces, and that is how to grow revenue. I'm Mark Drager. Let's get into it. Victor Antonio, you are a speaker, you are a consultant, you are an experienced executive in the sales area, and you're an author of a whole bunch of books. And so this might come off a little aggressive. My audience might get a little uncomfortable right now. But okay. when I see someone in your position, I think mm -hmm. two things. One, my goodness, they are very good at mm. speaking and at sharing and getting audiences to think about things in a brand new way, which yeah. is a whole skill set in a zone of genius. But two, I mm. think, have they been speaking for so long that they're so out of touch with what's actually happening in mm. the real world today? Because oh, you're kind of used to things from five or 10 or, or 15 mm. or 20 years ago. And so as a practitioner of sales mm. and as someone who educates and consults people, can you can we just kick off by saying, by, by you explaining to me, what puts you in a position to talk about sales in 2024? Yeah, by the way, I, I love that. You, you totally insulted me in a good way. But, but So let, let's begin with the speaking thing. So years ago, I joined Toastmasters because I wanted to get better at speaking. I remember I'd seen Zig Ziglar, the great Zig Ziglar speak. And I said, one day I want to be like that. So I, I started doing Toastmasters. And for those of you who don't know, Toastmasters is a speaking organization that's in your area. And they give you 10 speeches and you work on 10 different speeches over a year and get better at it. When I learned how to do speeches, presentations, my I can just say there was a, a direct correlation, proportional correlation between how good I was in presentations to my money. In other words, closing deals, right? And I was an engineer, so I had to learn how to present. If you really want, Mark, if you really want to just laugh, ha, 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 that type of thing. If you search Victor Antonio's first Toastmaster speech, you'll see it. It's pretty bad. I put it online just to give people inspiration. It's like, I didn't come out of the womb going, what's up? It didn't happen like that. Uh, I even have hair, if you really want to really have fun with that one. And so it took me a while, like anything else, when you work on a craft, you just get better at it. And so I wasn't that good when I first started. I just got better over time. And I, I think speaking, communicating, 
is a science and an art at the same time. And really dedicating yourself to that, I think, is important for anybody in business. Whatever you do, it's just important. Now, the second part. So I started out as an engineer, eventually got into sales. My motivation to get into sales was total financial incentive. In other words, for the money. Uh, we were starting a young family. Engineers weren't making as much money. I was designing like fiber optic network systems, uh, wireless systems. And they said, hey, would you like to be in sales? We have an opportunity. And they were looking for somebody who spoke Spanish. That's me. And so that's how I got into sales, did very well on it. Fast forward my career, I became president of sales and marketing, $420 million company. One day, May 9, 2001, 3.48 p.m., I decided to quit. And it was because I just wanted to do my own thing. And so I've been speaking since 2003, right? It's 2003. And the question you bring up is very good. It's a very good question to ask people, like, what gives you the right? Given the fact that everything is changing so quickly, and just let's put AI aside for a while, just in general, just the infrastructure, how we do business, transactional, complex, doesn't matter. Everything has changed so much. It's an, always in this, this amorphous state of flux. And so how do you stay current? I live by that. I forgot the guy's name. He was with Intel. He says, only the paranoid survive. Bill something, I forgot his name. And I've always liked that phrase because I think that's how you should be today. As I'm an older guy, I'm a baby boomer, Right. And so I'm always like, you do not look like a baby boomer, man. Dude, I'm a baby boomer, man. I'm, I'm 61. And the thing is, I, I think I have a young mind, though. That's what keeps me, go, you know, just hustling and going. And so I'm always paying attention to what the, I'll just say the younger generation is doing. Because I don't want to be that old guy. No, oh, that's not the way we used to sell back in the day. You hear that, you're like, oh, God, nobody wants to hear that. Crap. You know, when I was your age, this is how we did. Yeah, nobody wants to hear that. So Gen Z's, nobody wants to hear that. Millennials don't want to hear that. And so I'm figuring out how do they sell, which is why I've learned to, like my YouTube channel, I built it myself, right? Got over 200,000 subs. We're doing well. Uh, when it comes to video editing, I can do my own video editing. In other words, I've learned the tools to do it instead of just talk about it or just try to find somebody else to do it for me. And when it comes to sales processes, I really tried to read everything that comes out. I'm subscribed to so many newsletters, it's pathetic, right? And so I'm always looking for the latest research on what works, what doesn't work. And it's funny because, Mark, I have this perspective now because I've seen the pre-internet, now post-internet. And believe it or not, there's a lot of common things in these changes. But at the end of the day, what you're going to find is that people want to change. People want to buy from you, but they're afraid. Our job as salespeople is to find a way to reduce that anxiety. I always say reduce anxiety, increase certainty, and you'll close them. And so I'm very paranoid about how things are changing, especially now. So I'm constantly reading. That's my big advantage today. You've just made me feel so much better about my own paranoia. I mean, because, <laughs> you know, I'm 41. Uh, I started my agency 17 years ago. So I've been in this industry, I guess, for about 20 years now. Congratulations, by the way. Congratulations. <laughs> well, thank you. But by the way, not, I, I say that genuinely because it's not easy. You asked a question and I'll, I'll throw this one out. I'll interview you on your podcast. I love it. To, to keep your business running, people always go, well, Victor, when, did you, when was the last time you officially had a sales role, right? And I'm going, you mean when I worked for a company? Yeah, I'll say 20 years ago. And they go, well, you haven't been in sales. I'm like, Sh you idiot, shut up. Do you realize that to start a business and keep it going for at least 20 years, you better be a hell of a salesperson. And so I throw it back to you. Have you had to learn how to sell differently just to keep your agency growing or scaling? Oh my goodness. When people go, like when they ask me about a given part of my business, my growth, the ups, the downs, surviving COVID, surviving uh, the Great Recession, and, and they ask me anything, I go, well... I can give you answers in two or three year snapshots mm. because every two or three years, we either adjust or are forced to adjust. It's a good way of looking at it. And that's it. So do you want to know what things were like in 06 to 09? Do you want to know 09 mm. to 12? Do you want to know 12 to 15? Like literally I can break yes. down the chapters of growth, of uh, operational challenges, of, mm -hmm. of differences in terms of our clients and what they're asking for, commoditization of our markets, the squeezing that tends to happen where clients expect mm -hmm. more and more and more for less and less and less in two or three or snapshots. And at I, first- I love, Yeah, I love that. I, by the way, I just want to interrupt because I love that because it's, I never layered that time frame. Like I heard the name Jason somebody, I forgot who he is, sorry about that. Jason, he talks about millennials, all these different generations, I forgot his last name. And he said, there's a new generation every 22 years. It was something like that. There's a new generation every 22 years, right? So in other words- you got to kind of keep up. The window's shifting. After 22 years, nobody knows who you are. So you have to reintroduce yourself to a new generation. But I think what you said is very insightful. I never thought about that, that we should look at change layered on top of that. 
every two or three years. That's a good perspective. I didn't mean to interrupt you. Thank you. Oh, no, 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 no. And I mean, what we're actually circling around on is what I was hoping we would speak about. Because I've gone through, I've looked at your books and I've gone through your podcast and your YouTube channel. And I could take any one of the snapshots, any one of the topics that you speak on. Mm -hmm. And it's clear to me that you have thought that you are well-researched, well-experienced, thoughtful, and you explain in such amazing ways. So I, I hope I don't ever diminish the role that a coach, a consultant, or a speaker plays in getting audiences to think and to take action in new ways. That's not where I wanted to start. Mm -hmm. But I, but before we hit record, you did say like, hey, let's have a tough conversation here. And so in the back of my mind, I'm always thinking, are these authors, are these professional influencers, professional mm -hmm. authors, professional mm -hmm. speakers, are they kind of just full of shit because they know where mm. the joke lands. They know where the punchline happens. And if that's yes. your job, that's awesome. But what I want to talk about is how can my listeners increase lead gen? How can they increase revenue? How can they increase mm -hmm. sales? How can they remove indecision from the sales process? That's sure. what I want to dig into. <clears throat> no, it's funny because let's tackle the big one, the, the first one about speakers. The, uh, <laughs> I, I, I'm chuckling because, man, there's so many speakers who are just full of it. If you just scrape, you know, scratch the surface, there's not a lot there. In other words, it's a very shallow pool of information. And so I'm always looking at people's backgrounds. What'd you do before this? And so I came from the corporate side and I started in engineering, moved up through management, VP, then executive, right? So I suffered the slings and arrows of it all. And so nobody could tell me anything, which is why I think I could walk into a room with a lot of confidence is what do you want to talk about? I said, There's, you can't surprise me. You can probably tell me about some new technology. Pretty much I've heard of it. And it's really interesting. In the world of speaking, a lot of it is a performance. And I don't think people want... See, nobody wants to admit this. Everybody thinks this is like the World Wrestling Federation. To some extent, it is. because. But I think the best of the best know how to blend content, entertainment, and then insight. And I, use, I always say insight is information beyond the obvious. Like, I didn't know that. But there's nothing wrong with making it a performance, entertaining people, taking them on a ride, right? Having the journey. I think at the end, I don't care how you deliver your content presentation, whether you got those ooh-ah moments, you make them cry. I mean, I've seen people play the music in the background, that wispy music, and then just their voice drops. And everybody gets... And then it's almost like it becomes it becomes church almost, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, that to me is, a, is a, I always view that as a set, yeah, manipulation. You know what I mean? I am very left brain in terms of give me content, give me something I can use. When I walk out of here, please give me something I can use. So I love speakers who can give me content. But if you're an aspiring speaker, realize delivering content facts is one thing, but you got to wrap it up in some type of performance by that. Make it entertaining, make it engaging that they'll go, you know what? Not only did I enjoy that, it went quickly, but I, I learned so much. So that's why I would package that up. Now the big question. All right. So I like to, I have- Hold on, hold on, hold on. I just, we're going to get into the big question in a second. Um, but listeners, if you're like, what the hell is this guy talking about? I don't want to be a professional speaker. I'm going to circle around on why what we're talking about will help you with uh, joint ventures, with pitching new opportunities, with uh, your sales process, with training your staff, with better presentations, with uh, just better engagement at the networking events and what have you. Because what we're talking about, the ability to communicate, to wrap things in a story, the dog and pony mm -hmm. show, the experience you give people, this matters so much and is so often overlooked when we're trying to build a value proposition, a business yeah. case, a rationale. Mm -hmm. And so I want to circle around on this, but go ahead with the next Oh, one. that was beautiful wrapping on that gift. You know what I mean? That was beautiful wrapping with the bow on top of it because everything is, you just look at just presenting or pitching or getting somebody to buy into a concept or an idea. This is what I'm talking about. So it's not just about public speaking, it's about public presenting it in any venue. The When we look at business, I have, Mark, I have like ADHD bad like bad, right? And so I like to, I've learned that my brain works this way. I like models. I wrote a book called 50 Sales Models or something like that. And it's because I, I collect models. And so I want to share with the audience a couple of models that I use that might help them. And here are my statements. And so when I'm talking to an executive for your pitching, right? If you're pitching somebody, executives only care about three things. Investors only care about three things. One, and by the way, investors, I could add a fourth one, but Typically, here's what they care about. How can this increase revenue, reduce costs, or expand market share? That's it. Talk to any B2B executive. And if you're going in there to pitch a product or service, they want to know, how is this going to help me increase my revenue or reduce my cost or expand my market share? Right? One of the three, if not all three. I call that the value trinity. So every presentation has to be geared that way. 
And by the way, when we're talking to investors, we have to add the time component. How fast, how soon, how much, that whole thing, and how often. We have to add those, um, I guess, variables in there. The other thing is that there's only four ways to grow your business. That's it. There's four ways. Everybody wants to complicate this, but there's only four ways. Number one, you basically gain new clients. Number two, you retain existing ones. Number three, you re-engage people who stop buying from you, see if you can get them to buy again. And number four, I wrote a book around it, which is called Grow Your Existing Business, which is upselling. Now think about this. There's only four ways to grow it. Get new customers, hold on to the existing ones. One study showed that if I can hold on, increase retention by 5%, it can impact my margins anywhere, profit margins by 30 to 85%. Re-engaging is actually just going out there and trying to bring them back in. We're a known entity, so short, a shorter sales cycle. I like today, in today's market, I like growing my existing business, which is why I wrote Mastering the Upsell. By focusing in on just selling to existing customers, you can increase your revenue by up to 30%. But not only that, you increase your profit margin because they already know you're a known entity, which means your sales cycle is definitely going to be shorter. Access to the customer is going to be easier, which means in general, your cost of sales go through the floor, which means you're more profitable. And it's amazing to me how many people don't even think about upsell as a strategy. Everybody's prospecting. I get that. We got to go hunt for new business. But why aren't we selling more to our existing customer base if you have one? Couldn't agree more with you. If that's the right, I, I can never tell. Is it I couldn't agree more? I, <laughs> anyway. I agree. I, Just say, I agree with you, Vic. I agree with you 100%. <laughs> with you. Now, this actually plays a little bit into the whole idea of the experience, the story, the presentation, the dog and pony mm. show. Because let's say that you're working with a client over time. In my mm -hmm. experience, what happens is there's diminishing returns on the experience side of things, right? You come in with a brand new client. You are, let's say, much better than the competition. You work right. harder. You care more. You deliver faster. Whatever your value prop is, your unique differentiators, you deliver. And you mm -hmm. win over that client and they love it. And then months go by or cycles go by, quarters go by. And suddenly, I mean, the first time they work with us, it blows people's minds. I've right. literally, <laughs> it, it, it's absolutely amazing the results we're able to drive when someone mm. is starting with very little and getting a lot better. But as we yep. start to move into optimization, as we start to move into like small tweaks mm. over time, you know, the experience and the expectations are like, good job, Mark and team. You guys delivered exactly what I expected you to deliver, exactly <laughs> the way you did, the way you have the last 12 or 15 times. And we don't get any credit for continuing mm. to deliver on those things. And That's so I would always turn to my team and say, guys, what is the story? What, mm. are we, what, what were the wins? What were the losses? What did we learn? Right. What are we going to do next? What are we going to tweak? What are we going to change? What was the return on value? But more than that, what is the, the story of this month? What is the story of this mm. quarter? What is the story of this year? How are we responding to competition, to market changes? Mm. What's happening? Because if right. we come back with you've paid for X and we've driven Y results and they're pretty mm. consistent over time, mm. there is no story. There is no magic. You're not sharing your thinking. You're not sharing what, what you foresee happening in the future. You, you, right. You're removing all of that. And so it's very hard to retain those clients. It's very mm. easy for others to come in and steal them from you with a fresh story or introducing fear or what have you. Mm. But I'm sharing all this because to me, it all comes back to some of the lessons that you learned moving from an engineer to a salesperson to a presenter and the experience we're talking about, right. the story, the experience that we take our clients through. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that, but yeah, well, I mean, there's a lot of great, there's a lot of great content in what you said, but the, you know, you're astute to, to say it is like the law of diminishing returns, right? It's like, if I take you from zero to, I'll just say a million, you're like, oh my God, I love you, Mark, right? And then I now, because we're at a million, now I just take you to 1.2 million. You're like, okay, that was great. It wasn't because the first one, because their level of expectation goes up. It's almost like expectation creep, right? And excitement or motivation is always a function of expectation. If I expect this to be a higher number, you come in below that, I'm not excited. But if you, I was at zero, you took me to one million right away. I didn't expect that. That's the energy. And it's interesting because the it's how do you keep bringing that energy when you're not hitting those big numbers anymore? Now it's incremental, right? There's a wonderful book by, oh, it's such a great book. Tim Reister of Corporate Visions wrote a book and man, he made me just look at things differently. He says, and this is this goes to what you're saying about holding on to people or they want to switch. His whole thing is, and you, uh, it's conversations that something. I'll have to send you that. You can put in the link. 
I'm telling you, this book is gold. One of those silent sleepers that nobody reads. And I'm like, the three value conversations. I think that's it. I think that's it. The three value conversation. And one is, let's say that you're talking to a client, you're going to give them the six month report on what we've been doing. Right. And so for, to get them not to switch, you have to remind them how much work has been done up to that point. And his whole thing is you really have to work that messaging in. Here's how much work has been done. And we, you wouldn't want to start this all over again with another agency. This is why you want to continue going forward. And his, his format, his structure of how to deliver that message in a conversation is powerful if you want to hold on to existing customers. Because what he's done is embedded in their brain like, if I do switch, I have to restart this from the beginning. And th to them, it's not top of mind. They're thinking, well, maybe we should go with somebody else who will make, help us make more money, give us a bigger boost. But they forgot because that's how uh, humans are. We forget all the work that got us there in the first place. So anyway, I just thought I'd share it's that a, with you. because It's the reason why... <laughs> It's the reason why people leave their spouses, right? It's the like, oh my goodness, this shiny thing over here is so much more attractive. And then you start living with that new person. First of all, you've lost all the amazing stuff that you had with your previous person. And uh, you've kind of overlooked just the baggage that new person might yeah. bring along with them, no? Yeah. By the way, you're right, because it is the grass is greener effect, right? And then we forget. It's almost like our we get used to things. And I know there's a psychological phrase for it. You get used to things. You don't value it as much anymore. Mm -hmm. And it's how do you keep reminding customers that here's the value we've brought so far. And it's figuring out how to tell that story. Like, here's what we've done so far. And then reminding them, when we started two years ago, here's where the revenues are at. Compared to other companies, we're you know, on track to whatever growth. It's all a story. But I think we have to remind, I don't think, we have to remind customers what we've done for them. And in a subtle way, say, if you decide to change, here are the things you're going to have to restart from the beginning because you're not going to have them. How do you say that politely, though, right? In a conversation. Well, you don't want to say, look, you bastards, if you don't go with me, if you yeah. decide to go to somewhere else, you're screwed because you're not going to be able to do all this. You can't say it like that. You got to find a nice way of saying it. W one thing that I've always worked very hard for. Uh, so mm. there's a book about Apple uh, working with Steve Jobs. Um, mm. Gosh, I don't, I think it's just called Simplicity, maybe. Okay. But they talked about the fact that Apple was very good at making the invisible visible. The whole reason why when the iPod was released, the head, the earbuds, the headphones were mm -hmm. white was simply so if someone was sitting on a subway, mo the industry standard at the time was black. They went white. So the invisible, the device in one's pocket, mm. they, they have no way of showing what that is. But those white yeah. little earbuds suddenly that's are like, a good that's, point. I never thought about it. That's a great product. point. That's a great and point. And the reason why the Apple on your laptop, when you flip it up, is there, they were one of the first people to put their logos on that part of the laptop is to right. make the invisible visible. And so often what I'm doing with my team and when we're working through things is I want to, I mean, listen, we're a consultancy. We mm -hmm. work on strategy, we work on branding, we work on sales tools for people, but they don't know whether we spent half an hour considering mm -hmm. something yes. or yes. if 20 or 30 or 40 hours of work has gone into the research, the consideration, and what have you. Uh, and I've always found that my clients are really interested, not in the steps of the process, but the thinking, the exploring on their behalf, mm -hmm. the discoveries mm -hmm. that were found, the rabbit holes we went down, the reasons why we chose not to do things or to do things on their behalf. Mm -hmm. And so I have always worked to try and make that invisible visible for the people that we're working with. I always encourage our clients to do the same thing. And maybe even in your business, in terms of, I know that you've written many, many books. Mm -hmm. I, I honestly don't know what goes into being as Writing good at what you do from a speaking point of view, an author point of view, mm -hmm. a consulting point of view, what have you. And so I would just encourage everyone listening to, to look for ways to mm -hmm. make those things that you take for granted, that you assume everyone understands, which they don't. You assume everyone values, which they don't. And just mm -hmm. work to tell some stories the way that you're suggesting to make the invisible more visible. Yeah, I mean, that's a great point. The People ask me about books and why I write books. And this is going to be so egocentric right now, if not narcissistic. It gives you credibility. I mean, there's that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but but I write them for myself. Like, perfect example is the AI book, Sales Ex Machina. So I wrote that with my friend, J Dr. James Anderson, in 2017, and we published it in 2018. And going through writing that book on AI, this is 2018. Free chat GPT, nobody was talking about AI. I think we sold a whopping 50 copies of that book. Because everybody's like, what do you mean AI is transforming the world of selling? Because I'm always like, I'm like Paul Revere, if not the town crier going, AI is coming, AI is coming. We don't know what you're talking about. But that wasn't the point. You want to sell more books. 
I can't even tell you that any business from that book directly led to, you know, business came from that book. I can't tie the two together. I really can't. But what was, for me, what was gratifying, along with James, was that we had to explore every orifice of AI at the time. And you just get this understanding. You thought you knew something, but when you start writing a book, you realize there are a lot of holes in your thinking. And writing allows you to plug in those holes. Same thing with mastering the upsell. When I was looking for content, I'm mastering the upsell. And I found a book that was like, I don't know, 30 years old. And I said, why does nobody talk about upselling? And so I just went down the rabbit hole. And I thought I knew something about upselling. Nope. When I was going through the book, I was like, oh, I didn't know that. What about this? What about this? And it's those <clears throat> moments that make it very gratifying to write a book. And so what happens is you build this knowledge base over time that allows you to speak with a certain level of confidence and maybe answer difficult questions that clients can't answer. So I start from that point of view. I write a book because I want to write it and I want to see if I understand the subject matter. And if I do, then by writing it, you to some extent become an expert, a domain expert on that topic. And so if you were to give two or three tips, <clears throat> many of our listeners and many of our clients, they're in manufacturing, they're in industrial solutions, <clears throat> they're in engineering. These guys typically aren't coming from a speaking background. What advice would you have, right. the two or three things that we could do to be better at selling, at presenting, at connecting with people from your speaking background? One of my biggest, I'll say, client bases are residential home, residential services, pools, plumbers, HVAC roofers. Yeah, trades. And so, you know, obviously I came from, from the B2B side. So I talked to manufacturers. I was talking to manufacturers. They built a security booth. That was an interesting sales training process. But let's get back to the average person. And I'll say the average person who, let's say, you know, didn't come through sales. The, the reality is some of the best salespeople I've met are not fast talkers. I, I would argue they're not great presenters either. The thing is, they have such sincerity when they speak. But let me go deeper in this, because every time I hear somebody go, let's create a value proposition, you got to build that trust. It doesn't mean shit to me if I can be so blunt. So I've learned from an engineering perspective, what does that mean? So I've defined trust. Like a good engineer, I came up with an equation, right? And see if you agree with my equation of trust. The trust equation has three components. You hit all three components. I don't care how you present. You hit the three components, you're going to sell. The first one is you have to take the client's point of view. Understand what they're going through. Like, you know, just ask a lot of questions. Well, ask me, why did you call me? Why do you need this? Why are you trying to do this? What's holding you back? What are your biggest concerns? Just puke with them, as I always say. Really get in there with them and understand where they're coming from. So the first part is their point of view. Plus, you got to be a subject matter expert, like a domain expert. You got to know. And I just posted something on your subject and you're a domain expert when you're not in the conversation, you're on the conversation. Let me explain. And I, I stole this from Michael Gerber, who wrote a book called The E-Myth. And he said, never work in your business, work on your business. When you work in your business, you have to be there every day. When you work on your business, you have processes and people in place that you don't have to be there. I took that and said, hmm, here's a parallel. When you're an expert in your domain, you don't have to be in the conversation, you're on the conversation. When you're in the conversation, I have to think about what I want to say. I have to think about how I have to respond. You know, all that. I'm just like, I have to think about these things. When I'm on the conversation, well, guess what? I know my content. I know every objection you could possibly come up with. I know what response I have to give. So now, because I'm on the conversation, almost like a third eye looking down, if I say something and you you just shift your body language the wrong way or give me a micro expression or maybe a facial expression that I go... He doesn't get it. I can catch that. And at that moment, I can stop in the conversation and say, Mark, I just said this, and it doesn't seem like you really believe that is true or that is something you want. Can I ask why? That's what the best of the best do because they're domain expert. And the last part, part three, so point of view, I understand you. Two, I know my content. I know how I can help you. And then you're, by the way, you're sharing content with the client. Again, I go back to the word insight, information beyond the obvious. When you can get your customer to say, your potential customer to say, huh, I didn't know that. Never thought about that. Really, you did that? You can do that? I didn't know that. That's insight. So again, and then the third piece is, I call it the BIM. I had to come up with an acronym, B-I-M-M. -M, and that is you keep their best interest in mind. In other words, I look out for you. I'm telling you, I'm not trying to screw you here. I'm not trying to sell you something you don't need. Here's a minimum. And if you care about your clients, 
you say, here's what you need at a minimum, what you need to do. And you recommend something, but you do it with the best interest in mind, not just trying to maximize wallet share. So again, point of view, subject matter expert, never be in the conversation, beyond the conversation, and then always keep the customer's best interest in mind. And they can feel that trust in three parts. Let's, uh, let's just drop the mic there. Because <laughs> that Victor is, I have nothing. I mean, I can add to it, but you've said it all. And if you're listening and you're thinking, well, I, I do that naturally, then I think you've been in business for a very long time. And the tr next trick is how can you get others within your organization to do it more consistently? Yes. How can you train them? How can you equip them? How can you give them the tools that they require? Because I've spoken to many people on this podcast who talk about, you know, people fearing objections. If you are operating where you want to put yourself in the shoes of your prospect, mm -hmm. if you want to truly get to a place where you can make really great recommendations, and I, I love BIM, that what I say to my team is, are we going to do right by them? Mm -hmm. Like, like yeah. I want to work with good people and I need to know that I'm that we are doing right by them. They, I like they that have, too. They've trusted us. And maybe it's this old school type of mentality, but... It's a human thing. It's And this is why I, too many people focus on style. How do I speak? Structure of a speech. I get all that. That makes you more effective in your presentation. But I can't, look, I'll give you a story. We had a leak. We didn't know where the leak was coming from, but the corner of the wall is leaking, right? Guy comes, I mean, we call somebody, he comes over, ding dong, rings the bell, open the door, and he just says, hi, you called for a repair leak? Like that. And I'm like, yeah. He says, can you show me where it's at? I'm like, okay. You know, he walks in, we point. He says, it's all right. Walks out the door. My wife was like, who was that? I said, well, the guy you called. He just came in. I said, what did he say? I said, I don't know. He came in. You know, he just said, point to it. I pointed to it. And he's, I think he's outside. Like 30 minutes later, guy comes back and he goes, all right, here's the problem. And he defines the problem. Now, here's what's cool. He had a clipboard with him, right? He, and he had mapped out the, like a top view of our house, like the actual design, like the roof, like top view. And he said, you see right here, da, da, da. You also got a problem. Here's where I can fix the leak. That'll be about 250 bucks. It's a new repair. I can see where the flashing's off. He says, on top of that, I should ask, tell you that your gutter systems, they got the wrong size. I thought it would just cause this water back up. He says, tell me what you'd like me to do. I can fix the leak. I can take care of it all. What would you like me to do? And then we asked him a bunch of questions. He was like, bang, 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 just shooting him down. Like he knew what he was talking about. We're like, all right, give me the contract. <laughs> we didn't call anybody else. He had the personality of a rock. But the thing is, he was so, you could tell he was so good at what he did, you know, at what he does, that you just knew. You can ask him. I mean, we asked him tough questions. What about this? What about this? He goes, no, here's why. And he would explain things in such a way you go, damn it. Huh. And there was no flinching. There was no, there was just no show. It was just data. And we're like, all right. And guess what? He did well. He fixed our stuff. We've never had a leak since. Now, I bet you if that guy sprinkled a little bit of personality and follow-up mm -hmm. yeah. and story and a few other things, his business would take off. But, yeah. but I love I love I've, the core foundation of it. The, the thing is, I think we need to start with the core. And I think that's a great way of putting it, Mark, because I could argue that if he had more style and flair, I guess he could sell more. But I got a feeling this guy had enough business because I referred him to my neighbors. And then I can only imagine this guy lives off referrals. I've met so many people like this who are just, I'm just going to say blue collar, man. They're just blue collar. There's no flair to them, man. They just- Good and people. They are man, good yeah. people. Yes. And we're, by the way, I think we're starving, like mentally starving for people who would just say it, man. Just say it. Just, if you're really good at what, if you understand my business, you understand what you offer and you know how you can solve my problem, make the recommendation. If I know I can help you, I'm in sales training. Tell me what your problem is. And pretty much I already know what their problem is. It's either in the four quadrants, right? And I'll ask questions. I said, okay, what are the priorities? All right. And then I position myself as a subject matter expert by asking the great questions and asking them, what are they doing? Try the, you know, what are you looking at? He goes, did you ever try this? Did you look at this? And go, no, I didn't do that, Victor. I said, well, here's what I can do. Then I offer best interest in mind. I don't think you should bring me out to talk to your people. It's too expensive. I can do that if you want. I think we can do a couple of virtuals and handle this problem. After the first one, we can measure it. If you don't want to do a contract, that's fine with me. But after the first one, then you can determine if you want to do a contract for a year. And they go, 
Okay. And I have an incredibly high close rate, like 85% easy. Here's here's what I'm really excited about, though. You wrote a book, mm. you know, four, five, six years ago on AI. Mm. Everybody's talking about AI today. What yep. I'm most excited about over the next few years is authenticity mm. will win. Because mm. we are already, but just wait, everyone, we are about to be bombarded with fake bullshit. Yep. And everyone will be pitching this scam and that scam and this tactic and that tactic. And what if you and what, it, like all of this stuff. And I'm already part of mastermind groups where people are talking about how you scrape this off this site and you do this off this site to, 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 mm. to use AI to say fake videos to people with fake emails mm. to get them to believe that you're somehow real. And I'm like, right. this stuff is, but for those of us who have a real business with mm. real people and it's going to feel, there's going to be a period of a year or two or more maybe where it feels like we're losing out against mm. all the people who are cheating. Mm. But their businesses will disappear very quickly. And we will build sustainable businesses off of real relationships, off of doing best interest in mind, and off of trying to figure out what the, the true recommendations are. Because we have the industry knowledge we mm. are not going anywhere. We have investments in real people mm. and real technology and real processes and, and real fleets and all of that stuff. And so as everyone sees this rise and fall, and as it's super mm. tempting to try and jump into all the fake bullshit, truthfully, mm. if we just stick true to what has worked you know, over the last 10, 20, 30, 100 years, mm. we will come out on the other side, I believe, much stronger for it. And I think you said it earlier when you said, when you were talking about the, uh, the plumber, the welder, the roofer, in my case, is that the core values have to be there. In other words, you have to be good at what you do, have to understand them, and you have to keep, again, best interests in mind. You can't get away from that. It's like a universal law. And so the, the technology that we're seeing today, these are just machinations. That's all they are. The Kevin Kelly, Wired, founder of Wired Magazine, put it in, in perspective, and he doesn't get enough credit. And he said this about seven, at least 10 years ago. He said, to think of AI, and this is, again, almost 10 years ago. He said, to think of AI, you have to think of AI as a utility. AI is a utility. I go, what, what do you mean by utility? Right? He goes, it's like electricity. He said, like, electricity is in your lights, your cameras, your TVs. You don't see it. It's in there. AI will be a utility. So for people who say, you know what? I want to specialize in AI. Okay, that's like saying I want to specialize in electricity. It does, makes, makes no sense. What we're going to have are just more tools. As you pointed out, some will be used for good and some for nefarious reasons. But at the end of the day, you still have to deliver the goods, you know, which is here's what I can do to help you increase revenue, reduce costs, or expand your market share. And the authenticity piece is, is dead on because with so much, I guess, artificial stuff going on, right? It's going to be all these fake videos, all these fake avatars, all these things that are making us efficient. The downside of that efficiency is that we lose connections, the human connections where people make the buying decisions. So I've been speaking with Victor Antonio. And if you'd like to learn, know more about him, we'll have all of his details at the end. But I will just say that he recently released a book, Relationship Selling, Managing Human Connections as Sales Assets. And it's available on Amazon and everywhere you might want to find books. And mm. he gets into a lot of this type of stuff in the book. Now, Victor, I do have one question for you I like to end every interview with. And oh. if you gave us one tip or strategy to help us sell more, what would that be? Ah. <sighs> I'm going to go with your operating system, which is your brain. And that is, there's something known as the fundamental attribution error. And the fundamental attribution error is you attribute something to something you think might happen. And too often as salespeople, we don't make the call, well, they're just not going to buy. They're just not going to answer. They're just not interested. When in reality, maybe they're just busy and you haven't grabbed their attention. So manage your operating system, which is your brain. I think that is the biggest skill set that we all have to learn. It's what we say to ourselves that determine whether you'll be successful in sales or not. That's really it. I hate to say that it's 80% mental. It's really, I want to be specific. It's what you say to yourself. I mean, and sometimes salespeople don't listen to what they say themselves. And the fundamental attribution error where we discount something because we think they're not going to buy, they're not interested, the market's going bad, all these external things we can't control. Between your ears is wetware. And again, you just have to figure it out. There's always a way to make money, whether the economy is up or down. I always say there's always a way to make money and make sales. You just have to make sure that what you say to yourself is the positive and not just feed into what everybody else is talking about, which is the negative. So that was the conversation I had with Victor Antonio. And to wrap up, I'm going to share my three biggest takeaways from this talk. Key takeaway number one, effective communication and presentation skills is vital for business today. And Victor emphasized 
that you have to master both the art and the science of speaking. And this is gonna help you in sales, but not just in sales. It will help you as a leader sharing your vision with your team. It'll help you with recruitment. It'll help you make deeper connections within your network. It will help you in so many ways. And so not only will you build confidence the more you speak, not only will you develop storytelling techniques, but all in all, it will make you a more well-rounded business leader. Key takeaway number two, I have to focus on the value trinity. Victor introduced the idea of the value trinity, focusing on the three outcomes that every senior leader, every executive, every investor cares about. And that's increasing revenue, reducing costs, or expanding market share. And ideally, if your service can do two or three of these things, you will do very well. So make sure that you are always tying your services, your products, your benefits. If you're speaking to a senior leader, tie it back to how you're going to increase revenue and, and what that's going to look like, how you're going to reduce costs if you can, and how you're going to expand market share. And key learning number three, I really loved the way that Victor shared that he used his book writing technique and his researching technique and his presentation technique as almost a, a framework or an excuse to learn about deep subjects and continue to hone his internal skills. Victor stressed the importance of staying current within the industry and always continuously learning, making sure that we don't age out, making sure that we don't remove ourselves so much from the front line. We don't understand customers. We don't understand the current challenges or the current technologies. And so as a leader, the, the deeper you go in your career and the higher up you move within your company's structure, the larger the team, the more removed you become from day-to-day -day operations, you run a really great risk of losing touch with the front line, losing touch with the technology, the systems, the processes, and, and the clients. So I love how Victor spoke to the fact that he uses his book writing process as a way to go really deep. And so I challenge you, what is your process? What is the excuse you use? What is the framework you use to ensure that you stay current and you stay on trend and you stay up to date with what's happening on the front line? So there you have it. Those were my three biggest takeaways from this talk, but I'm curious, what were yours? Anything challenge your perspective? Let's dive deeper over on LinkedIn where I share more insights and I love just to spark conversation over there. I'm Mark Drager. You can find my contact details in the episode show notes. Now, while you're over on LinkedIn, be sure to follow Victor for more proven value-centric sales strategies. You can also check out more about his work over at victorantonio.com. You can find him on Facebook and X and YouTube. He is everywhere. And one last thing, if you've made it this far into the show, you really should subscribe. And here's why. Obviously, you're an ambitious B2B leader. You're hungry for even more actionable strategies to grow your business and to boost sales. And if that isn't reason enough, then I don't know. Maybe you think I'm a nice guy. <laughs> Either way, I am Mark Drager, and I will catch you in the next episode. <laughs>